In our last video, we talked about measurable functions, and we said that we are going to use these type of functions to define integration. Now in this video, let's see how we can get measurable functions from already known functions. What I mean by this is that we will see some tools that will be helpful for us to determine whether a given function is measurable or not. And the first example is actually very trivial. Let's say we have two functions, f and g, that are defined from some set x, and whenever I say a set x, I'm always talking about the set with a sigma algebra n. So these functions are defined in x and go to the complex numbers. Now, if you don't know much about the complex numbers, then you can just think of these as the real numbers. The same result will be valid for the real numbers. And these two functions are m measurable. Remember that what this meant was that whenever we took some set b, in this case I'm going to say in the Borel sigma algebra but on the complex numbers, that is actually equal to the Borel sigma algebra of R2, then the preimage through f and through g, because they are both measurable, the preimage of b is an element in the sigma algebra m on x. So we have two measurable functions, then we can prove that the sum of these functions, so f plus g is measurable, and f times g is measurable. To prove these two things, it's actually not so complicated, because all we have to do is, for the first case, consider a function phi of x, y, so it will take two numbers, and then give us the sum of these two numbers, and for f times g, we will have, let's say, psi of x, y, and it will return the multiplication, and then define a function, let's call it f big of x, that's going to be f of x, g of x, and so these three functions are measurable because f and g are measurable, and we can write f plus g and f times g as the composition of these two functions, and then we know that the composition will be measurable. So I'm just going to leave this as an exercise. The second tool we will see is that what happens when we have a sequence. So we have f sub j, a sequence of functions f sub j, each is defined from, again, a set x with a sigma algebra m, onto, and let me write it like this, r bar, and our bar is the extended real line. If you are familiarized with complex analysis, then you probably already know this notation and are used to using the extended real line. But if you aren't, then, well, basically the extended real line is allowing our functions to take the value infinity. So the extended real line is equal to the real line union, the infinity. So our function, could actually be f of x for some x equal to infinity. We are allowing it to happen. So now the Borel sets in the extended real line will be generated by the rays. But what form will the rays have? Well, they will be of the form a infinity but closed in infinity. Uh, this is plus infinity and closed in minus infinity a. And, well, they could be closed or open on the extreme A. So, whenever we want to test if a function is measurable and the function is defined on the extended real line, we will have to check it for these types of sets. So, what's the result? Well, we have a sequence of measurable functions. Then, let's call them G1 of X, defined as the supremum over j of fj of x, so the x is fixed, and we just take the supremum over all the functions, g2, the infimum, g2 
the upper limit and g4 the lower limit are all measurable let's first prove that g1 that is the supremum is measurable So what we have to do is prove that the pre-image of G1, let's say the pre-image of A infinity, closed infinity because we are in the extended real line, we have to prove that this set is in the sigma algebra. Well, I'm going to prove that this is equal to the union over all the j's of the pre-images of the A infinity. This proof is not actually that complicated because now if I manage to prove this equality then what I have is that because each f sub j is measurable then the pre-image of A infinity will be in the sigma algebra, each of these. And then I'm taking the union over elements in the sigma algebra then all these will be in my sigma algebra and that is exactly what I have to prove for G1. So now the problem comes down to how do I prove this equality? Well, let's do it with an inclusion. If I take x in the pre-image, then this means that a is smaller than G1 of x. This is if and only if. And g1 of x is the supremum of f of j of x. And a number being less than the supremum happens if and only if there exists some index j0 such that a is smaller than f of x in the index j0. And so what this means is that x is an element in the pre-image of f j0 of the a infinity. And then this happens if and only if x is an element in the union of all these pre-images. So because these are all connected through ifs and only ifs, then this is not an inclusion but an equality, and we have the result. So with this, g1 is measurable. Doing the same calculations, we can prove that g2, the pre-image of the minus infinity a, is also the union of the pre-images of f of the minus infinity a. This can be done the same way. And so we have that g2 is also measurable because of the same reason we have that the pre-image of f is in the sigma algebra and then the union of elements in the sigma algebra is also in the sigma algebra. So again g2 is measurable. Now we have to prove that g3 and g4 are also measurable. So for this, let's use the definition of the upper and lower limits. Let's prove that g3 is measurable, then g4 will be done in the same way. So g3 is the upper limit of our function. What we will do to prove this is use the definition, and this is actually very useful, this technique, to solve other exercises where we have to prove something for the upper limits. We will define a function hk of x that is going to be the supremum over the j's of fj of x. So because of what we just proved, we know that hk is measurable. And now because of the definition of the upper limit, g3 of x is actually the infimum over k of 
h sub k. And so g3 is the infimum of a sequence of measurable functions, and again, because of what we proved, g3 is measurable. Well, using the same technique, with the infimum first and then the supremum, we can get that the lower limit is also measurable. And so, we have this great result. Given any sequence of functions, we have that all these four functions are measurable. And this, believe it or not, is going to be very useful. An immediate consequence of this is what happens when we have a sequence of functions and we think about its limit. Well, when the limit of a sequence of function exists, it means that the upper and lower limit exist and they are the same. And because the upper and lower limit are measurable, then the limit will be measurable. So what I'm saying is that if the limit when j tends to infinity of f sub j of x exists, let's call it f of x, then f is measurable. And again, the reason is very simple. It is just because f of x is going to be equal to the upper limit and to the lower limit. Because these two are measurable, then we have that f will also be measurable. Another consequence of this is that if f and g are measurable, then the maximum of f and g is measurable. And also, obviously, the minimum of f and g is measurable. So here you go, you have nine examples of measurable functions. In the next video, we will be talking about a very important family of functions called the simple functions.